Culture Rule with Jack. Welcome to The Lag and Stream, which explores the key issues in the great city of Belfast. And on each edition of this podcast, we will spotlight the bridge builders, peacemakers and leaders who are promoting Belfast as a modern tech city with unlimited promise. In particular, we'll provide a platform for voices from our global Irish family, drawing heavily on events and conferences hosted by our sister organisations, Ashling Events, Belfast Media and in New York, The Irish Echo. In this edition of the Lag and String podcast, we're bringing you another captivating discussion from the Irish Roundtable in the Valley, which was hosted by Ashling Events in Stanford University on the 9th of May 2024. Our topic is AI disruption in the workplace. In the chair is Ken Nim, Director of City Build with the City of San Francisco, Julie Lind, Executive Officer of San Mateo Labour Council, Steve Morrow, CEO of Belfast-based global company Options IT, and legendary fintech business figure John McDonnell of Phoenix Managed Networks. Great, thank you. It's truly an honor, honor to be uh, chairing and moderating this panel, especially as we see and we've heard a lot of conversation about emerging technologies. Things move fast. A lot of times our workers are one of the last to be considered, right? So it's an amazing to have our labor leaders here, Gene and Julie, to talk. Uh, now, from your experience, right, the disruption, the impact, how do we put workers in the forefront from your perspective to minimize that, that disruption or what are those disruptions that you see? Um, so this is honestly the question that I was most excited about and the question that I'm grateful your group chose to ask. What are the disruptions and how can they be mitigated? So you've heard a lot about the positives of AI, the opportunities created particularly in STEM for careers and opportunities for professional growth for those individuals. But what I think often gets left behind is the conversation about those that are displaced by AI who are not going to seamlessly transition into this role. So I think we need to be having more conversations as to what that looks like, more commitment to advocating against displacement. And for individuals that end up being displaced, I think it's incumbent upon those companies to help them first try to find roles within that company, try to educate them into having a role on the back end of AI, and absent those, helping them transition into a different external career so that they are not left behind. I think we also need to be making sure, as Jean had said, training people to interact successfully with the new technology. But there are pieces of the workforce whose jobs are becoming automated or whose jobs are threatened to become automated that won't easily transition. So you've probably seen a lot in the news about autonomous vehicles and the excitement around deploying autonomous vehicles in our different jurisdictions, looking at autonomous vehicles for long haul trucking. But I think we've seen that it's incredibly important that we maintain a human presence there. You saw the challenges with crews in San Francisco. We see for those folks looking at trucking, these trucks not being able to respond appropriately to natural disasters, to inclement weather. If you look at bus drivers and you're looking to automate a bus, what if somebody needs help getting onto the bus because they're differently abled or they're one of our older folks? What if somebody is hurt on that bus? This computer is not going to be able to assist them. What if there's a threat there? If I am a bus driver, if I am a truck driver, it's not gonna be easy for me to just turn around and become a technological wizard. I personally couldn't do that. My brain doesn't work that way. Probably one of the many reasons I sure didn't go to Stanford. But we need to look at these things with cautious optimism. We need to remember that technology is supposed to exist to bridge the gap between wealth and opportunity, not exacerbate it. There need to be roles for all pieces of our workforce that are impacted here, and there need to be spots for these people because the future of work cannot be successful if it does not continue you to include workers. So before we deploy these technologies, we need to, number one, ensure that they're actually ready to be on their own, but there needs to be continuous monitoring to ensure efficacy, to ensure that federal privacy laws, civil rights are upheld. But to the greatest degree possible, we need to keep remembering that these jobs started being done by people. These are people that deserve to have access to family sustaining careers. And these are people that we cannot leave behind because we are excited about something shiny and new. 
Jean, anything else you want to add from a labor's perspective? Julie did an excellent job, I think, giving a, an overview of some of the key areas of concern and excitement. And so just a couple of things to add. Um, and it should be an area of concern and interest to all of us, which is just accountability and oversight. The idea also of the concern of a big brother um, kind of role of technology and making sure that there are systems in place so that when we go to work, there's also not, you know, I don't want someone monitoring how many times I've, you know, typed on my keyboard on my computer to determine my value as an employee or as a human being. And so I think making sure that we have policies in place to protect workers from those concerns are critically important. I think the other thing um, just to consider in the the transition to the future of work, which is a, a kind of a sexy term that I think means something different to everybody, which is not all jobs are, are equal. And so to consider taking somebody who's been a 20 or a 30 year journey person, electrician, and suggest that they now install solar panels at a wage lower than what they've earned for the last 30 years as a professional isn't a foundation for address transition conversation. So I think we also just need to live in reality a little bit more. And then I would just offer, um, how many people took an airplane to get to this event? I would imagine a few of us either coming from Ireland or different places in the United States. And um, I, I know that every time I get on a plane, I am usually greeted by a, um, not only the flight attendants, but also by the captains. And many times, every day, all day, those airplanes are run by computers and buttons, but there is a human being in that cabin, and I know that brings me great comfort, and I think that's a really good example of watching technology over a few series of, of decades or transitions, figuring out how to absorb technology, but also recognizing that we need human beings in control of important positions. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Stevie and John, as you see, as you heard the conversation, especially human capital is very valuable. Right? You're building amazing products, right? From the products you're building, where do you see the disruption, the opportunities, help with uh, efficiency in the work that you do in your company? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it, I think it is, it's really worth going back to that point and that human capital. Um, I mean, we are a tech firm. We are building new technology and we're, we're heavily reliant on AI and we're, we're very excited about it and, and I agree with all those points. You know, we, we really see the value in doing it and uh, Tom mentioned earlier the, the productivity gains, you know, you can, and you can put percentages on these things uh, and that will raise up you know, mediocre employees to, to a higher level and, and, and for those at a higher level it probably doesn't give you that level of gain but I think we definitely see it just in those in those ways that I've talked about, that one-dimensional world where it gives you just massive productivity gains. Um, now, you do have to temper that with what what impact that has on, on a workforce in general, and can you bring those people along? Because there's no point in taking those huge productivity gains uh, and not having the, the employees come with you, or indeed the consumers that you're trying to sell come with you as well. So I do think that there's... We're, this is very exciting and it's hugely interesting to come to this sort of forum, but um, having also lived through the, the internet age and, and a number of the mobile age, you know, I don't remember having the same conversations then as to how can we better use this technology and how can we better not control, but how can we temper the benefits or, or enjoy the benefits for it for, for all? So that does give me a lot of um, comfort, if you will, that, that this time around and this truly disruptive technology is largely having a positive impact. You know, if you go back hundreds of years, and Eric put up a very interesting graph, you know, there was a lot of losers on that. I mean, I think if you zoom in, it wasn't just a smooth graph in terms of GDP. We didn't hit the Industrial Revolution and everyone then you know, sat back and, and, and reaped the benefits of. There was lots of ups and downs to that. So it is worth remembering that, that just, uh, technology can be hugely disruptive. But those technologies were specifically designed to have an impact on labour. They were specifically designed to reduce costs and reduce labour overhead. AI does have a very different feel to it. It is about productivity, it is about a technology for the improvement rather than the replacement of labour. So that also gives me uh, great comfort or, or benefit for, I think, 
for the future. So that's worth remembering as well, I think. Thank you. Stevie, John? Sure. So yeah, I've got a couple of real life examples from my investment, personal investment activity, a company called Scripted, which is like a clearinghouse to match copywriters to marketing firms at, at corporations. And about 18 months ago, they saw AI coming and you know we had a hair on fire board meeting and the pivot was to ask the copywriters to actually become experts in using AI, right? In other words, instead of humans clacking out the content, think blogs, marketing collateral, press releases, uh, they were actually asked to start leveraging AI and crank out way more. So with the same number of freelancers, and you know they're freelancers, so there were no layoffs, but sure enough, there was an anticipated dip in new signups while you know the needle came off the vinyl, right? What's, what's happening? We can just use AI instead of humans. That reversed itself. Over the last six months, uh, new subscriptions have increased. The same number of freelancers are now covering 5X the number of companies, right? Another one is the one in Belfast, Picker. It's a productivity tool that is intentionally leveraging AI, um, and their target market is universities, or at least the launch market, uh, researchers, students, you know, faculty, et cetera. AI is an, a component of that, okay? But then privacy considerations, security considerations came up. Researchers using AI for you know, confidential research. So it couldn't just be a wrapper on ChatGPT, which version one was. It's now a siloed open source version of AI to protect the privacy and the security of what's being researched. So it can be collected and shared, think Pinterest plus Slack, right? Where you can curate a collection and then share it with authorized, you know, discrete, identifiable people to help on a project, right? So it was launched in Sweden, where the founders are from. The pilot was at Swedish universities. It's now being used at University of California, San Diego. Um, and for whatever reason, they've targeted universities as probably because of the long tail of the students, getting the students adept at using AI tools as part of their research, uh, and of course, researchers that do that for a living. Thank you for that perspective. We're just about to wrap up this panelist. And uh, my question to the panelists as a final word is, what is your call to action? I know uh, when Charlie brought me in and invited me to participate in this, I've known him for over 20 years. He's always said to me, people over profit. So that's my call to action. Each of our members here, Julie, what is your call to action to wrap up? So yes, to Ken's point, we are Charlie's fault, Gene and Ken and I. So if you have any issues, please take them up with Charlie Lavery. You can find him right there. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> Um, so my, my words, my final words of caution to you. So as Jean had mentioned, we represent a lot of people. Um, between the two of us, probably about a quarter million workers and their families. And I've been doing this for a long time. This is my 15th year with the Labor Council. And never has a worker come to me and said that they were excited about AI becoming part of their workforce. So we have these discussions about bringing workers along but they're not happening yet. And there's a lot of focus and a lot of excitement on opportunities for our white collar folks, but our blue collar folks are not being brought into the conversation and continue to be left behind. So my caution to you is to remember all aspects of work, all aspects of our population and all aspects of our workforce and truly dedicate yourself as you work to shepherd in this new technology to ensure that you are bringing everyone along with you because if all of us do not come together to be successful, we will instead collectively fail. I, I think all, all labor has value, and what's exciting is to think about also the new jobs that are going to be created out of these conversations around AI. One thing that I think that we learned as a labor movement this last year is the connectivity between every industry and job and AI. Whether you're a Hollywood scriptwriter or you drive a garbage truck, it affects you, it affects your family. So I would say our call to action, our responsibility, is to make sure that everybody who's impacted has a voice at the table to shape the future. Thank you. Um, I would say my call to action is probably the same thing I say to my kids. Um, and along the same lines, I, I have no idea what your job's going to be in five years, because it, it, five or ten years, um, because I have no idea it doesn't exist. And so I would say is to make sure you're looking to the horizon and uh, make sure that you're focusing on training, learning, 
um, and adapting to the new technology so that you're not trying to earmark or pin your hopes on something that may not be there or doesn't exist. So that would, that would be my thoughts. Yeah, I, I'd say keep an eye on the prize, which is productivity gains. You know, the term creative destruction, right? It applied to software, the last couple of overhauls of sort of the tech labor force. And I, I've got ethical concerns about AI. Somebody brought up, you know, autonomous military weapons and, you know, Skynet, et cetera. That's sort of outside the scope of this call to action, right, which is labor. But uh, I, I do feel that if we can keep, you know, keep the regulatory standards uh, up to date and up to speed, you know, uh, make sure privacy considerations are, are managed appropriately. From a labor perspective, uh, I, I see upside to productivity. Thanks for listening to this edition of Lag and Stream. If you want to learn more about our work or attend our events, go to the Ashling Events website, www.ashling-events.com. Slang of foil, Gurmayag of Assistant.